I'm Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, and welcome to the January 29th, 2018 edition of the Weekly Top 3, our 15-minute-ish podcast where we address the top three issues that are on our mind as we make the turn from the week in the past to the week ahead. Keep in mind that this and the past editions of the Weekly Top 3 are available at any time on our YouTube uh, page, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets on YouTube, and that you can check any time during the course of the week for updates on these or any other issues uh, on our Facebook page, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets on Facebook. Here's the top three issues that we're following this week. First, uh, the American oil model and the Alaska recession. Why uh, Alaska's departure from the American oil model uh, as it's doing through the PFD cuts uh, is worsening, deepening the Alaska recession for Alaska's citizens uh, and its local economy. Second, POMV, percent of market value, an approach to how to determine earnings from the permanent fund for both the PFD and for the state share, the other half of the, uh, of the permanent fund earnings, as Governor Hammond uh, talked about early on. Uh, our thoughts on POMV. And third, a brief discussion of our thoughts around the use of the permanent fund uh, in, in connection with the Alaska LNG project, an issue that came up uh, in a hearing before Senate Finance this week. First, let's start with the discussion of the, quote, American model of oil leasing. Those of you who listened to the podcast from last week will recall that we had a discussion there of the historical uh, roots of the permanent fund dividend and a discussion of the genius of Governor Hammond's approach to replicate in Alaska what went on, what goes on uh, in the lower 48 in the oil producing states where they have a private system of mineral oil leasing. Basically, the lower 48 states oil in the ground is owned privately uh, by mineral interest owners and when developed by oil companies the royalty payments, the payments under the leases are paid directly to those private owners uh, and that money then shows up in the lo local economy. Under the Statehood Act uh, in Alaska the mineral interests are owned by the state, uh, are required to be owned by the state such that uh, the payments and uh, royalty uh, payments initially are paid uh, to the state as a result of the Statehood Act. That means in Alaska, absent anything else, the money that goes into local hands in the local economy in the lower 48 states would bypass that in Alaska and go into the hands of state government and be spent by gov centrally by state government in a manner that uh, state government would decide. The genius of Governor Hammond's uh, vision for the PFD was that he changed that dynamic, at least with respect to part of those revenues, and through the PFD diverted that revenue, a portion of that revenue, back into the hands of, of citizens and local economies so that the Alaska economy ended up looking a lot more like the oil economy in the lower 48 states than a centralized government economy as you might find in Azerbaijan uh, or any other uh, country where uh, oil uh, is owned uh, centrally uh, by the government. That topic came up again in a conversation I had over the weekend with an economist from Scotland who's very familiar with the global oil industry. We were talking about the Alaska recession and he asked how the Alaska government had responded to the recession. My response was that in part the Alaska government uh, had cut the PFD in a way which transferred money out of the hands of citizens in the local economy back into uh, central government uh, as a way of increasing government revenues. His response as an economist was that was a pity because it would have the effect of increasing the impact of the recession on individual Alaskans and on uh, the local economies. He likened uh, the situation to Petra states uh, where, uh, uh, like Saudi Arabia and other centralized governments, where when a oil price downturn came, the government essentially 
pulled uh, money back into central government to be allocated by central government, uh, which rewarded what he called the dependence uh, of government, rewarded them by, by making sure they continued to get uh, revenue, but was at the expense, but occurred at the expense of the broader economy, uh, the non-government related economy where pulling that money out of the economy uh, uh, had the effect of enhancing, increasing the recession and increasing the adverse impact uh, on citizens. He, he compared that to the America model, which he said was, was in his view, a very, for this purpose, a very good approach to dealing with oil revenue because it spread the revenue, oil revenue, initially uh, very broadly, put it into the hands of local citizens uh, and, and enabled those local citizens and the local economies better to survive economic downturns, uh, oil price downturns, uh, when, when those occurred. That's caused us to go back and do some additional research about the nature of the American model and its impact on uh, local economies and its importance to local economies. And in fact, we found some significant papers that have dis discussed just that issue, the importance of, of the American model in maintaining uh, local economies and in maintaining the economic health of, of local citizens, uh, particularly uh, during economic downturns, the broadening effect that that approach has. And, and frankly, has, has led us to conclude again how important the genius was of Governor Hammond and how important to the Alaska, the broad-based Alaska economy uh, the permanent fund dividend is as a way of helping to support uh, individual citizens and, individu and, and, and local economies uh, throughout Alaska, uh, particularly when it's facing an, an economic downturn, uh, and how detrimental uh, the PFD cut is to those local economies and citizens uh, in terms of re-centralizing, like you would find, frankly, in a socialist country, re-centralizing those revenues in government and having a, a government decide uh, and favoring government dependence over, over local economies and local citizens when distributing those revenues. That's an issue you're going to see us talk uh, and write about more uh, in the coming weeks as the PFD debate uh, uh, continues and what we will mean uh, when we talk about the, quote, American model uh, of oil leasing uh, compared with the, frankly, socialist model. The second issue we're following this week is the discussion about POMV, or percent of market value. POMV is a methodology that some are advocating should be used to determine the level of earnings from the permanent fund that then are to be divided between the permanent fund dividend uh, for the benefit of residents and the remaining portion uh, for uh, the use by state government, uh, all as Governor Hammond uh, intended. At its core, POMV to me is simply a different way of accounting for uh, inflation uh, and smoothing the earnings flow uh, or the distribution of revenues uh, to the pot that, that's, that's, that, that then is used for the PFD and divided between the PFD and uh, use by state government. It's not, some, I think some view it as having more nefarious intent than that. Um, I, I don't. Uh, I think it's truly just a different way of accounting for uh, inflation and smoothing uh, revenue flow. And in a lot of ways, I think, frankly, particularly from the standpoint of inflation proofing, I think POMB is better uh, than, the pro than the approach we've got in the existing statute. When you sort of work your way through what happens in the existing sta statute with inflation proofing, you can see periods of time when in fact we're double counting for inflation, we're putting more money uh, aside, setting aside more money 
uh, for inflation than, infl than in fact is needed. And the way that the current statute works, setting aside that additional money for inflation proofing, takes money away from uh, the earnings stream uh, and reduces the amount of money going uh, in the case, in, in the way the current statute works, uh, takes away the amount of money going to government. Some may think that's good, but, but frankly, that just increases the pressure for taxes or for cutting the PFD because government thinks it needs money if it's not getting money uh, because it's being too much is being set aside for inflation proofing, it's going to look for it someplace else, and it's going to look for it through either uh, creating taxes or cutting the PFD. So I don't think double counting for inflation uh, is 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 a very good approach uh, uh, to have as part of of the current statute, and it doesn't always double count for inflation. Sometimes it undercounts for inflation. It, it frankly is sort of a happenstance when it hits inflation, uh, the amount of, of money that ought to be set aside for inflation. So, frankly, I think POMV is an improvement uh, over that, over the, over the current system, uh, with respect to how we account for inflation. The problem with POMV is that it's gotten combined by its advocates with proposals to cut the PFD. When people talk about POMV now, uh, most people's minds go to, well, POMV is a way of cutting the PFD uh, because it's going to restrict the flow of earnings and people who talk about POMV are the same that, as are talking about cutting uh, the PFD from 50% of earnings down to 30% of earnings down to 25% of earnings. So it has become... Uh, uh, bollocked up, if you will, or become confused uh, in many people's minds with the discussion about cutting the PFD and, and is taken by many, when, when you mention POMV, is taken by many uh, as, as code for a way of cutting the PFD. It doesn't have to be that. Uh, you can have POMV and still have a 50-50 distribution of the resulting revenues, the resulting distribution between the PFD and government. You can still maintain Governor Hammond's original vision of 50% for the PFD, 50% for government uh, when, when government needs it, uh, and, and do that as easily under POMB as you can under the existing statute. In fact, because of the problems with the way inflation proofing works under the existing statute, POMV probably would be would result in a better uh, uh, distribution to the PFD uh, and and government split between the PFD and government long term than than current than continuing to use the current statute. But because people who are advocating cutting the PFD are confusing that or talking about it at the same time as they talk about the POMV, um, it, it's become a very confusing discussions, discussion to at least a lot of Alaskans that I talk to. So going forward, I think you're going to hear us talking more about POMV, but trying very, very clearly to separate it from the discussion about PFD cuts and focus entirely on the benefits of POMV from the standpoint of inflation proofing and smoothing the earnings flow. Finally, let's take up our third issue for a, for a few moments, uh, and that is the discussion that we've heard about the potential for the permanent fund, for uh, government to use the permanent fund to invest in and help support the AKL and G line. Frankly, we've not heard the governor uh, talk about that. The one uh, discussion, as we said in a previous uh, uh, weekly three, uh, the only discussion we've heard the governor make of talking about using public funds to invest in the pipeline was the use of uh, the PERS and TERS pension funds. Um, uh, he uh, talked about that in a conversation with uh, Alaska Journal of Commerce. We haven't seen it since, but we've never seen him talk about using the permanent fund. 
there's a very simple reason why you wouldn't use the permanent fund, and we think if this discussion would ever mature to the point where there was a serious proposal on the table to make use of the permanent fund, that it, that it would and should quickly die. The permanent fund was set up to invest in out to invest outside of Alaska, in other economies, in in growth um, uh, opportunities in other economies um, outside the state. That's intentional because you don't want to double down. You don't want to use the permanent fund to double down on the Alaska economy. The Alaska economy goes through highs. It goes through lows. Um, and if you had the permanent fund investing in the Alaska economy, what would happen is the permanent fund would go through lows, make make the Alaska lows even deeper lows. They would potentially make the Alaska highs even 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 higher highs. But you don't want that sort of repetition uh, by your investment fund uh, in the local economy or in the state economy. You want you want the the, the investment fund, the permanent fund to really offset the highs and lows that are going on uh, in the state economy and to have sort of a constant state of growth by being invested in opportunities wherever they occur in the world uh, to take advantage of those and to, and to move dollars from one opportunity to another opportunity in order to maintain fairly constant growth uh, of the investment fund. If you started investing it internally in Alaska, you would see well, there's a lot of issues around that, including the potential for corruption. Uh, but you would see uh, sort of a, 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 a repetition or a dual wave uh, when the Alaska economy went through its very variations of the permanent fund following along and sort of deepening those uh, uh, as, they, as they went along. So there's really there's no good case to make for investing the permanent fund inside uh, of Alaska in the Alaska economy. Uh, when the permanent fund was set up, uh, the expectation was it would look outwardly. Uh, there, the ADA, uh, the Alaska Industrial Development uh, and Export Authority, was set up to sort of be the internal investment arm uh, uh, at the same time and to look for opportunities where or situations where government needed to spur growth uh, inside the state. But the permanent fund has always been external looking uh, as a way of modifying or offsetting uh, the potential bad aspects of the Alaska economy and to sort of provide a revenue source that is independent of how the Alaska economy is doing at any particular point in time. We think that's an important characteristic uh, that should be continued. So that's going to wrap up this discussion of the weekly top three. This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We very much appreciate you joining us. Remember that you can always go to our YouTube page, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, on YouTube to find this or any previous uh, weekly top three podcasts. We invite you to join us uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, like and follow us on the Facebook page for a discussion during the week of the topics we've discussed here as well as, well as other topics as they come up during the week. Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to having you with us again for next week's The Weekly Top 3.